you to be seated, friends. I believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Do you believe that too? It's especially important tonight. We want the Bible's answers on this very serious subject. It is titled, Spiritualism Exposed, Death's Mystery Solved. Thousands of people are wondering about this topic of death, and there seems to be for many a mystery about what happens beyond the grave. Where do you go? What's going on? Are there thoughts that are being had there? Are people doing things after they die? What happens when you die? People are wondering. Perhaps, can the dead communicate back with the living? People have these kinds of questions, and you can see it evidenced on the fronts of magazines. Here's one for you. Life ran this cover. Visions of life after death. It says, the ultimate mystery. Here's another one from U.S. News and World Report. It says, life after death, science's search for meaning in near-death experiences. People are interested in this subject of death. Are you interested in it tonight? To know what's going on here? Would you like the answers that you may have been needing for so very long? There's contradictory opinions out there. We want to know the facts. People Magazine had this to say. Almost 70 million Americans said they think it's possible to communicate with the dead. Bill, is that true? Can we talk to the dead? How does that work, you know? Well, in trying to communicate with dead people or in an effort to get answers regarding death, some have gone to seances and, you know, played with Ouija boards or maybe called the psychic hotlines, visited mediums and so on, trying to get answers regarding this subject. And it's understandable why they might. I mean, have you ever been to a church funeral where the pastor's up front and he's talking there about the person that has passed? He might say something like this. Dear beloved, uh, you don't have to worry about dear Aunt Betty because she's up in heaven right now enjoying the good things God has for us there. Trying to comfort the folks. And then maybe a little later in his sermon, he might say something like, well, you don't need to worry uh, yourselves, dear Aunt Betty. Her presence is right here with us in this room, and you can be comforted by that. But then he gets out at the graveside service. You decide to go to that, and then he says something like this. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust, one day dear old Aunt Betty is going to come out of the grave at the resurrection. Where is Aunt Betty? <laughs> you know, the same pastor. I mean, is she up there? Is she right here? Is she in the grave? Where is Aunt Betty? We need to know. Say amen. The Bible has the answer, friends, and we're going to find out tonight. Where should we go to find the answers? Do we need to go to the tabloids to get the answers? Is that the right place? Call the psychic hotline? It's not as though those things didn't have some kind of answer, but we want the right answer, and so we go back to the Bible to discover the answers regarding death. Well, it does give clear answers. We're going to look here. In the book of Revelation, we've spent a lot of time in Revelation, some time in Daniel. We go there to see if there's anything that we can find about the subject of death. Here it says, Jesus, in his own words, I am he that liveth and was, what does it say? It says he was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of what else? Death. Okay, this subject about hell we're going to study tomorrow morning. Don't miss it. 9.30, you'll want to be here. All right, so who's the biggest authority in all of the Bible about the subject of death? It's Jesus. He says he ha he was, he's alive, but he had before been dead, hadn't he? He's the authority on this subject. He's experienced death. He ought to be able to tell us what it's all about. He has the keys to unlock the mystery of this subject to our minds tonight. It's when we go to sources other than the Bible other than Jesus, that we can get off course. Notice what we read here. Revelation 12, verse 9, there is somebody that is trying to deceive the world on various topics, and this one is included. It says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the who? Devil and Satan, which does what to the whole world? Deceive it. That's King James. It's telling us the devil is a deceiver. The devil is a liar. The Bible also helps us understand and Satan, the deceiver, the great liar, has, well, well, he's put forward his first great deception against the human family in the book of Genesis. Let's look at it. Did it have anything to do with this subject that we're studying tonight, that great deception in the beginning? Let's look at it in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? 
And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So it's very clear. You eat this fruit, and you are going to die. God has shared that information with him. They've, uh, she's told the serpent this. All right, now, what does Satan have to say in response to this? Satan has taken the form of a serpent, or speaking through a serpent here. What does he say to this woman? He says this, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That is deception. God said, You will surely die. Satan, through the serpent, says, Ye shall not surely die. Who do you think told the truth, God or Satan? God told the truth, didn't he, friends? And yet did you know that many people in this world and down through the ages have taken the side of the enemy on this question? They have chosen to believe the lie of the serpent, ye shall not surely die. So we're going to see how that lie has propagated down through history, has even infiltrated the church, and it has been the source, the underpinnings, the grounding of so much error and deception in our world. What does the Bible really say about death? Well, to find out more about death, we're first going to look, look at how life began. Genesis is where we stay in chapter 2. Verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. What are we made of? We're made from the dust, the Bible says. Or you might think of that as like maybe the elements of the earth. All right. The dust of the ground. Then it says, And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So it's not just breath that's being added to dust, it's breath of life, and when that's been added to the dust, he's breathed into the breath of life, man becomes a living what? Man becomes a living soul. So you can imagine it there in your mind's eye, perhaps God fashioning that lifeless form from the elements that are available to him there. And when he's finished, it's, it's got all the features of a man, right? The fingers, the toes, the everything is there, the features, but something is missing because... It is lying there motionless. It is completely inanimate. And so what does God do? The Bible says he breathes into it the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. So we get a little bit of math here. He says the dust plus the breath of life that God is breathing into it, and the result of combining this two is that you have now a living what? A living soul. Or you could say the elements of the earth combined with God's breath and a living being is the result of that. Now, I'm going to share with you that this, uh, this breath of life, what you find, it's really a metaphor for God's life-giving power, all right? Let's examine it in another way here. In the book of Job, we're going to see it expressed another way. Job chapter 27 and verse 3. What we find in some of the Old Testament Hebrew poetry is that they would rhyme thoughts. So they would say something one way, and then they'd back up and say it again, but use some different words to do it. Here we find an example of that in Job. It's called synonymous parallelism. The first time he says it, all the while my breath is in me. That's one way to say it. Now he's going to back up and he's going to say it again. It says, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. You see that there? So you've got the breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in his nostrils. Now, where did God breathe uh, when man was formed? It says he breathed into his what? The breath of life. Breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Here you've got the breath is in me. Here you've got spirit of God. It's a metaphor for the power of God to bring to life that which is lifeless. Are you following this with me? Whether you call it this, uh, the spirit of God or the breath of God, or, or uh, it's talking about the same thing. This is not a reference to the Holy Spirit of God. Is that clear this evening? This is not the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. This is the power of God imparted so that it would bring life to the lifeless. The elements of the earth, the power of God coming together to make a living soul or a living being. Now, if you think about um, a light bulb, you basically got to have two things to bring illumination into a room. You've got to have a light bulb of some kind, and then you've got to have power going through it to create the illumination, right? So you've got the bulb, and then you've got the power, and then illumination results. Now, what happens if you go over and you unplug the lamp? The light bulb what? It goes out. That's right. No more light because it, the power has been removed, hasn't it? 
And what you're left with then is a bulb or a dead bulb. So you remove the power source and the light goes out. And it's rather like that, if you will accept the analogy, it's rather like that with death. You have the body and then you have God's power. And when you have the two, you have life. You have a living being, a living soul. What happens when the power is removed? God's life-giving power, all you have then is the body or a dead body, right? Well, what happens? Now, how does this work? Let's look at it in the Bible. Before we do, I want to address one other, I want to address one thing here. What about this term soul? What about this term soul? Somebody says, I hear what it said up there. It said body plus the breath of God, and that it, it created a living soul. Someone says, but I thought I had something inside of me called a soul. Now we're reading about here that it says we are souls. Let me share a couple other passages in the Bible that show you that this is true. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, we read it. It says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Talking about people here. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 what? That's a reference to people. That's not a reference to disembodied vapor ghosts. People are being baptized, and they're being called souls. Here's another one, Acts 27, 37. And we were in all in the ship, 200, three score, and 16, what again? What is he saying to us? He's saying the ship had about 276 people on board. No, 276 people, that's what they had on board. All right, souls on the ship, souls being baptized, people being baptized, people on the ship. We use that word soul similarly today. If you came back this coming Sunday for a seminar subject at 7 o'clock and you uh, were able to look in the glass or, you know, the window or the doors back there, and then, you, you know, you'd go home and you could say, honey, or call your friend, I went to the seminar, I didn't see a single what there? I didn't see a single soul there because we don't meet here Sunday evening for a seminar subject, right? So we use that word soul, too, to mean people. And yet many have been taught that we have inside of us something called a soul, you know, contained within us, that we're some kind of a wrapper for this, you know, some kind of a ghost-like essence inside of a person, and it goes flitting off to a place of paradise or a place of torment, depending upon how the individual has lived. The question we want to ask tonight is, is that a biblical concept? Is that from the Bible, or does it come from another source? Now let's, expo uh, let's explore this a bit further, the subject of death. All right, what happens, we talked about life, now let's talk about what happens when someone dies. You take the body plus the breath, it equals a living soul. What happens when somebody dies? Genesis chapter 3, we look in verse 19. Now, a little background on this verse. God is here telling man what is going to happen to them as a result of their sin. After they leave the garden home, this is what their experience entails. He says, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. Aha, uh -huh. it says, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. What was man formed from, did the Bible say? He says it was formed from the dust. Now God is saying, you're going to return to the dust. All right, you careful accountants. Okay, when man was made, how many ingredients, how many basic ingredients went into making him up? <laughs> Two. <laughs> All right. You had the what? The elements of the earth and the? The breath of life. Now, that was when life was made, or man was made and life given, right? A living soul was created through the combination of the dust and the breath, or the elements and God's power. Now he... Man, when he dies, it says that the body returns to the dust. Are we missing a piece? Aha! Good accounting. What happened to the breath of life part? Good question. Now, this verse doesn't tell us. For that, we go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Notice what we read here. It says, then shall the dust return to the earth. Isn't that what we just read in Genesis 3? Yeah. It says, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the what... Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. What do you think that spirit is a reference to? What did Job say? Go back to Job and compare it. It says, all the while my breath is in me, and the what? Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Here it is. The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit, or what? 
breath or the power of God returns to who? Returns to God who gave it. You mean to tell me that the ingredients that went to make man a living soul, those ingredients go back where they came from upon death? Is that what the Bible says, yes or no? That is what the Bible says. So those two building blocks, they go back to where they came from, all right? God's power returns to him. The body returns back to the dust. Psalms 146, verse 3 and 4. Is there more in the Bible to support this? It says, put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth. That's just another way of saying God's power is returning to him. It says, he returneth to his where? His earth, that's the body going back to the dust. Same thing as Genesis 3, same thing as Ecclesiastes. It says he returneth to his earth. Now look at this, it adds, it says, in that very day, his thoughts, what? Is there any thinking going on in the grave? Is there any thought process going on after death? Not if you believe the Bible. It says, in that very day, his thoughts perish. So when a person dies, the breath of life leaves, returns to God, the body returns to the dust. Basically, you find death is creation in reverse. And there's no thoughts after death. All right. Now, that might still cause someone to ask the question, I hear what you're saying. That is what the Bible says. I'm reading it for myself. I still wonder, though, about the soul, because that's what I've been taught, is that there's something inside of me called the soul. That when I die, that it and it up or down, depending on how a person's lived. And you want to know something? Books talk about that, I'm sure. Movies present it, don't they? Preachers preach it. The question still remains, where do we get our truth from tonight? From the Word of God. It, it, is it written in here? That's the question for the Bible student. Haven't you seen on repeated nights now that often the Bible has been sharing truth that is completely different than what we were taught. Isn't that what you've been finding night after night? It's so true. And that's why it's so important for you and I to go back, back, back. And we're not going to just look up one or two verses on this and hinge a whole entire theological doctrine on it. We're not going to do that. We're just going to read what the Bible passages say, put them all together, and say, now that is a holistic picture of Scripture. Now, if you have some questions by the time we're done tonight, don't hesitate to write them down and put them in that box, okay? And then tomorrow morning, expect some more answers to come. Well, someone says, I heard that I had that thing inside of me called a soul. All right. Did you know that the Bible uses the word, the term soul or spirit in almost 1,000 times? Almost 1,000 times. And out of the almost 1,000 times the Bible uses the term soul or spirit, not ever, not even once, does it attribute the soul or the spirit with immortality. Now, what do we mean by that? Think about this with me. If when we die, if it were true that we had something inside of us, invisible, vapor-like, called a soul, that went to heaven or hell, and as soon as we died and continued to live, then you would expect that the Bible in some place would say that the soul is immortal or that the spirit is immortal. But it never says it not even one time. Out of the almost 1,000 times those words are mentioned in there, it never once says that. Someone says, can you prove that? I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's look up every single verse in the Bible tonight that uses the word immortal and see what it says. Every single verse in the Bible that uses the word immortal. And we'll still get out on time. All right? Okay, here we go. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. It says, Now unto the king eternal, what's that next word? Immortal, immortal invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, friends, we've just read every single verse in the Bible that uses the word immortal. There's only one. And who is it talking about? It's talking about, it's talking about our God, isn't it there? Our King. And so we're finding here that this is not a reference to a soul or a spirit. Someone said it's God that has immortality, not some piece of us. So then we could ask the question, if we nor any part of us presently has immortality, then how could we possibly live on in heaven or hell as soon as we die? That doesn't make any sense at all. This term immortal is used for God. Someone says, well, you're talking about immortal. But I bet there's another form of the word immortal that you're not talking about. That's the one someone could say, what about immortality? Maybe you should have looked up that one. You know, that occurs in the Bible too. And you can see it five times there. We're going to look at one of them. It pretty well settles the case. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 and 16 says, the king of kings, are we talking about the same one we saw in the last verse? Yes. It says, the king of kings and lord of lords who what? Only hath immortality. All right, who only has immortality? God only has immortality. 
well, then how can any part of me be living on in heaven or hell as when I die if God is the only one that has the capability to live forever? Right? It doesn't happen. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says human beings are mortal. Job 4.17, Romans 6.12, Romans 8.11, 2 Corinthians 4.11. Do you know what mortal means? That means we are subject to death. We are subject to death. The Bible says God only has immortality. Romans 2.7 says we are to seek immortality. And I have a good question for you right now. What sense would it make for human beings to seek immortality, to look for immortality, if we already had it? Why would the Bible say look for it if we already have it? Do we have it right now, yes or no? No, we don't. We, nor any part of us, currently has immortality. That is a gift that is going to be given in the future, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 53, on resurrection morning. Immortality is given to the mortal, but not until Jesus comes and the resurrection takes place. Where did we get this idea, then, of an immortal soul that goes to heaven or hell as soon as we die? Well, you trace that on back in history now. It contradicts Scripture, but you trace it back, and you can find that the uh, the ancient, ancient peoples believed in this like the ancient Babylonians believed in the teaching of an immortal soul. Also, the ancient Greeks believed in the immortality of the soul. The ancient Egyptians believed in the pagan doctrine of the immortality of the soul. So there does seem to be a connection, then, doesn't there, between the pagan elements of the world and this teaching of an immortal, naturally immortal soul. Yet the Bible says the exact opposite about soul. It says in Ezekiel 18.4, the soul that sinneth, it shall live forever. It says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Why? In this context, this is soul is referring to a, an individual, a person here. That's one from the Old. Here's one from the New Testament. Let him know that he which converted the sinner, that's a person, from the error of his way shall save a soul from what? Souls die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Where did the Christian church get this idea from of an immortal soul if it's not scriptural? Where did they get it from? Well, that's a good question. The modern Christian church got it from the Church of the Dark Ages. The Church of the Dark Ages got it from pagan Greek philosophy. If you trace it on back, you'll come all the way back to the Garden of Eden where Satan, in the form of a serpent, gave the first recorded lie, ye shall not surely die. And that lie has found its way right on down through history and has infiltrated the Christian church, and it has great appeal. But the question is, is it in the Bible? Wait a minute, brother. Wait just a minute. You don't understand. I have read a book that says somebody was in heaven for 90 minutes or somebody was in hell for an hour and a half, you know. Or I, I, you know, I died once on the operating table and I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. I know somebody that said they saw their dead grandma sit beside them on their bed. You don't understand. I had an out-of-body experience. And I want to share with you something tonight. I want to share with you what the Bible says. Can you say amen? amen? What does the Bible say? I'm not saying people don't have those experiences. We need to ask the question, what is going on with those experiences? But we always need to come back to the Bible to find the truth. Amen? Amen. Even if we never knew what was happening in those experiences. Now, I think we can know a good bit about that. But even if we never knew, we have to figure out where we're going to put our trust. Are we going to trust experience? Or are we going to trust the Word of God? This is the only safety, friends. If experience and history tell us anything, it's in trusting the Word of God that is our safety. All right? It's when we begin to rely on experience that we can get let off course. You know who can lead us in experiences? Jesus can lead people in experiences, can't he? A revelation of himself, he certainly can. Can Satan lead anybody in, it, in their own experience too? Well, do you think Satan could lead people in experiences even inside the Christian church? Oh, if they were open to it, certainly he could. Why wouldn't he? I mean, that would be the best plan of all, wouldn't it? If he could find a way to get into the church, well, that would be something. Hey, do you remember what Jesus warned us about in Matthew? Was it chapter 7 that we were reading over there? And he says, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we do many wonderful works? And didn't we do it in your name? Do you remember that? That was in the church. Lord, Lord, professed Christians casting out devils and working miracles. And what did he say to them? Depart from me, I never knew you. Ah, well, I wonder if Satan does have the ability to work in the church then. What do you think? Sure he does. And what do we need to do? We need to go back to the where? 
experience is a lousy indicator of truth. Experience tells you, supernatural experience tells you that something supernatural is at work. It doesn't tell you what source it is from. You have to go back to the Bible to find out what source it's really from. And so that's what we're going to do now. Well, this teaching of a naturally immortal soul came from paganism, has, it came from the Garden of Eden, and uh, where the devil told that line, has found its way in the church, and the church has embraced it without going back to check it out, some of us. Well, how does the Bible repeatedly refer to death anyway? Let's keep going. There's more. Psalm 13, verse 3 says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, lighten mine eyes, lest I, what the what of death? Sleep the sleep of death. King David believed that people die, and that when they die, he referred to that death as a sleep. And there's a good reason that he did that. Notice what we read here in Daniel chapter 12. It says, And many of them that sleep in the where... That's talking about death, isn't it? Because when we die, the body returns to the dust. It says, sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. It's when they awake that everlasting life ensues. They don't receive everlasting life as soon as they die, you see. It has to happen at a different time. Daniel called death a sleep. The Old Testament writers used the phrase slept or rested with their fathers as an expression for death. Do we see any evidence of that in the New Testament? We sure do. Guess who it is that is using that reference of sleep to refer to death? John chapter 11 and verse 11, it is Jesus Christ himself. Notice what we read. Now, in this chapter, it contains the story of one of Jesus' closest earthly friends. His name was Lazarus. And Lazarus got sick. And we're going to read here about uh, what takes place in this discussion between Christ and his disciples regarding going to see Lazarus. It says, These things said he... And after that, he saith unto them, to his disciples, our friend Lazarus was sleepeth. So he's sleeping. He was sick. The disciples knew about that. Jesus says he sleepeth. It says, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. What is Jesus talking about here? Well, the disciples think they know. It says, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Now, most of the time, that would be true, right? I mean, if you're sick, sleep can help a lot of times. Howbeit, Jesus spake of his what? Death. Death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is what? Lazarus is dead. So let's boil it down here. Jesus says Lazarus is sleeping. Then to be clear about it, he says plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus refers to death as a sleep. Why? That's a good question. We're going to come back to that. But let's study the story of Lazarus here a little bit. The Bible says the righteous who die are asleep in Jesus. It's a beautiful thought. Well, Jesus now goes in this story uh, to Bethany, and Lazarus has two sisters, one of them by the name of Martha. She understands, she hears that Jesus is coming, and so she goes out to meet the Lord, and they have a conversation. Well, what does Jesus have to say after this dear woman's brother has passed away? She says to him, or Jesus says to her rather, in John eleven twenty three, 23, thy brother shall rise again. Notice what Jesus did not say to comfort this dear woman, one of his close friends. He didn't tell Martha, Lazarus is in heaven right now. Why didn't Jesus tell Martha, Lazarus is in heaven right now? Oh, you see? If you're trying to comfort someone, look what Jesus does. He says, thy brother shall rise again. Now, what does Martha say to Jesus? Does she set the record straight? She says, Lord, you misunderstand. Lazarus is in heaven right now. I told you my brother died. He's there, you see. What does Martha say to Jesus? Does she argue with him? What does she say? I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the when? Last day. Jesus knows the truth about death until a resurrection. Martha knows the truth about death until a resurrection. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and Martha, the friend of Jesus, are on the same page about the subject of death being death until the resurrection at the last day. Are they on the same page? Say amen. amen. We need to get on the same page with Jesus tonight. Can you say amen again? Amen. It, death is a death until a resurrection at the last day. Well, this is true, what she says, but Jesus is going to do something special on this occasion. He's going to show something that's very revealing about his power over the grave. Verse 25 says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. All right, he's going to perform a small 
life-giving example here. It's really a small-scale example of what he's going to do for all of his friends one day at the last day. It says this, And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! Where has Lazarus' body been laid? Inside that tomb. Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Why didn't he say, Lazarus, come down from heaven? Why didn't he say, Lazarus, come up from hell? Because Lazarus hadn't been in either of those places. Do you understand that with me tonight? He said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus died. The power of God, according to his other verses, went back to God who gave it. Lazarus' body's been laid in the tomb. It's going to return to the what, did the Bible say? Dust. But Jesus goes to the tomb now. He says, Lazarus, come forth. Did Lazarus come forth? The Bible says, And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. Now, Psalms chapter 146 remind us, reminds us, it says, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. So the day that individual dies, no more thoughts. Lazarus had been in the grave for something like four days. Jesus comes, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. But four days dead, right? Something like that. If Lazarus had gone straight to heaven as soon as he died, four days in heaven, that would have been quite an experience. Isn't it something that you can find books in the bookstore, maybe Christian bookstore, talking about people's experience in heaven or hell or floating off a table or something like that? You don't hear one peep from Lazarus after four days being dead. Not one peep. Isn't that incredible? Doesn't there seem to be some kind of a, what's going on here? Now, Lazarus was one of the very closest friends of Jesus. Jesus says Lazarus was sleeping. And then he resurrects him, and Lazarus doesn't say anything about his experience in heaven. Why is that? Because Lazarus wasn't where? In heaven. What happened to Lazarus' thoughts when he died? In that very day, what happened to his thoughts? His thoughts perished. Friends, we've got to choose who we're going to trust. Are we going to believe some novel in a bookstore? And I'm not saying they didn't experience something. I'm just saying, what are you going to believe about the subject of death? Some book at a bookstore or the Word of God? You've got to figure out which way you're going to go on this, friends. You've got to make a choice. Trust Him or trust somebody's experience. I am going to trust Jesus Christ on this, on everything, by His grace. Well, God's ways are the best ways when you think about it. Someone says, but I don't even like this whole thing about death. I don't think God likes this whole thing about death either. This was not His plan. His plan was for us to live forever, wasn't it? In a sinless world, sinless universe. We have the choice, and we made the wrong choice. And though we made the wrong choice, God had a way to rescue us back, didn't he? Now, we're experiencing the results of our own rebellious choice. Now, don't blame it on Adam and Eve. The Bible says all have sinned, all right? We've followed their rebellion. We have copied their course. We have been every bit as rebellious, if not more, than they have. We are are guilty as well, okay? Now, the wages of sin is death. We are diseased. We are dying. And Jesus knows that. He doesn't want it to stay this way. He has the keys to unlock death. He has the keys to disease. He's going to take care of it. But in the meantime, until he finally does, until he, and there's a reason why there's a, why it hasn't happened yet. There are reasons for that. But until he does, he does the very best thing he can as it relates to death. When a person dies, they don't go somewhere up or down. He says, the breath returns to me. I know just exactly who they are. I'll take care of putting it back together. You trust me, all right? The body goes to the grave. It returns to the dust. It's no problem. At the resurrection, he brings them forth. You want to know what the passing of time is like, maybe, for someone in death? You could liken it to a blink of an eye, maybe, all right? The snap of a finger. Have you ever gone to sleep one night, and your, your sleep was so deep and so, uh, you know, so, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> well, yeah, the passing of time would seem instantaneous. Now, sometimes we don't get that kind of sleep very often. But have you ever slept, you know, maybe six, eight hours, and you close your eyes, you open your eyes, and the passing of time is just like that, right? That, it, when that happens, imagine death being something like that. I mean, the passing of time could be one year, two years, ten years, a hundred years. If it was 10,000 years, it would be the same. It's the blink of an eye. You close your eyes in death, you open them, it's the resurrection. Now, that's amazing. Now, the, the Lord did not create death, but while it's here, he's doing the best thing he can. Can you imagine what it would be like if a dear mother would die, passed away, and left her children here, and she went straight to heaven? Would heaven really be heaven for her, looking down here and seeing what her children are experiencing? No. I mean, she's up there for, you know, all those decades and, and, and hundreds of years, maybe watching her children and their children and their grandchildren all the way down. What a horrendous view. 
as she watches this child make poor choices, that one goes off to some military thing, gets both legs blown off in a roadside bomb, this person and other children, and then the grandchildren, you know, get it messed up with drug abuse and things like that. You know, what a mess. What a mess. But you know what God does? When a person dies, they close their eyes in sleep. The death of sleep. And it seems instantaneous. And the resurrection takes place. All right? It's the best thing, isn't it? God knows what to do the best that he can in the middle of this mess that you and I have participated in. Well, where do the dead go when they die then? Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. You already know the answer, but it says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. That's future in the which how many? All. Come on now, how many? All that are in the where? Graves, that's where they are, shall hear his voice, just like Lazarus heard the voice of Jesus calling him forth. It says, and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that is the first resurrection. Why'd you say first? Because it says, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. That is a second resurrection. We're going to study those two resurrections when we study the millennium on a night to come, all right? Don't miss that subject. Two individual ones there. You know what the great reformer Martin Luther had to say on this? You heard of Martin Luther? All right, notice what he said. We shall sleep until he comes and knocks on the little grave and says, Dr. Martin, get up. Then I shall rise in a moment and be happy with him forever. Did Martin Luther know the truth about death as a sleep until the resurrection? He sure did, friends. That's the way the Bible teaches it. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, 6, and 10, there's more. It says, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not. How much do the dead know? Do you believe what the Bible says tonight? The dead know nothing. It says, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Now, that's going to change when Christ comes, all right, in the resurrection. But not until that time, they do nothing. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Is that clear tonight? Amen. All right, that's clear. No knowledge where you're going, no wisdom there. Based on everything we've studied right now, if I were to ask you a question, say, how many people, based on all we've learned tonight, how many people are in heaven right now? Now, you might, uh, the first answer you might say is no, but that's a trick question. That's a trick question. How many people are in heaven right now that have lived on earth? Well, there are those that actually are in heaven. You see, if you left here tonight without knowing what the Bible says on this, there, the, what we've been studying is the general teaching about death from the Bible. But the Bible does show us there are a handful of exceptions to this general study. What do we mean by that? Have you remember, do you remember a man by the name of Enoch in the Bible? The Bible says uh, that, he, that he was not for God took him. That's over there in Genesis chapter 5. What about this man? Uh, Elijah. Did Elijah go to heaven without seeing death? He sure did in a fiery chariot. Enoch is in heaven. Elijah is in heaven. Now, the Bible may not be quite as explicit about Moses, but there is good indication that he is there as well. In Jude, verse 9, you read about Michael contending, if you like, arguing with the devil over the body of Moses. Now, Moses did experience death, but do you remember when Jesus was with, was, was with three of his disciples on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration? And who was with Jesus up there? You had Elijah, and who else? Moses is there. Moses is in heaven tonight. So there are some biblical exceptions to the general teaching, and I want you to know that tonight, because you could leave here and somebody could say, but Elijah and Enoch and Moses are there, that means everybody goes to heaven. No, the general teaching is the people are in the graves waiting for the resurrection, and there are a few handful of exceptions there. And you need to know about that, all right? Well, why did we study all this? This subject tonight is, is titled, Spiritualism Exposed, Death's Mystery Solved. Well, the Bible has just solved the mystery of death for us tonight. What about that other piece? What about spiritualism? What we've studied here tonight is going to help us now to expose one of the greatest deceptions that the devil has been using in this world to reach people's <coughs> minds to lead them away from God's word. We're going to study about spiritualism or spiritism. Have you heard of Shirley MacLaine? Time Magazine some time ago. What about those like Shirley MacLaine who claim or claim that they have the ability to talk with the dead or, you know, or channel with spirit beings, I should say. What do we say about them? Are they communicating with spirit beings? If death is the end, how can they be communicating with dead people if death is the end? 
All right, they can't be, right, if we understand what the Bible says. Now we know the principles about death from Scripture. We're going to study a little bit about the principles of spiritualism and what it's based on. We're going to read these two principles from a work by J. Arthur Hill called Spiritism, History, Phenomena, and Doctrine. This one's on page 25. Claim number one, principle one of spiritualism is this. Spiritism claims the dead are not dead. Quote, there is no death in the graveyard. I have frequent talks with the dead. Now, that's what spiritualists would believe in, okay? Point number two, from the same book, same page, spiritism claims the dead communicate with the living. The fundamental principle of spiritism is that human beings survive bodily death and that occasionally under conditions not yet fully understood, we can communicate with those who have gone before. So do you see the claim here? The Bible says the dead know nothing, the dead praise not the Lord, there is no knowledge, wisdom, and so forth in the grave, whither thou goest. No thoughts, in that very day their thoughts do perish. All that are in the grave. Isn't that what we've studied so far tonight? Say amen. And now spiritist, spiritism says, nope, they're not really dead. Number one, they're not dead. And number two, once they go to the grave, they can communicate back with the living. All right. Now in Hydesville, New York, there's a, there was a family in history with the last name of Fox. And the parents, this is where modern spiritualism is said to have gotten its beginnings. And the parents moved into a home with a couple of their daughters, and, and experimentation was conducted in the home with rapping sounds, or knocking sounds, and supposed communication with the dead was established there. And this is a marker that uh, commemorates this, if you will. It says on this marker, there is no death, there are no dead. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like what the serpent told Eve? Ye shall not surely die. Has it found its way still down into modern times today? Yes, it has. That lie has found its way to our day. Shirley MacLaine says this in that Time magazine. It says, I believe, she says, that souls. Now listen to how she defines souls here. I believe that souls, she says, invisible entities. That's fascinating how, uh, how an... an a spirit channeler uh, would be explaining soul this way, an invisible entity. And that's the way the Christian church, by and large, describes it pretty much, isn't it? An invisible thing inside of us. And so here you've got someone that comes from a background of spiritualism, or has a uh, background of spiritualism or spiritism, describing it as an invisible entity. She says it's an invisible entity. She says are, are a part of... I believe that souls, invisible entities, are a part of the cyclical harmony of nature. None of it ever dies. It just changes form. So there you go, right? It doesn't really die. It just changes form. Revelation 12, 9, remember what the enemy is all about. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he's doing exactly that. Why are we presenting this subject tonight? One of the reasons is so that we can escape the deceptions that the devil has in using, abusing a misunderstanding of this subject. Here's one for you from a tabloid. See some of this out there, don't you? How to contact your loved ones in heaven. Is that possible according to the Bible tonight? Yes or no? No, that's an impossibility. It cannot be done. And yet people are trying to engage in conversations with those who have died, going to seances and so forth, where some have claimed that they have been able to communicate with dearly departed loved ones. Now, they might be communicating with something, friends, but what we're studying here tonight is they're not communicating with their dearly departed loved ones, not if you believe the Bible. Who are they communicating with? People are saying things like, well, you know, I saw a ghost, someone could say, you know. I've been visited by this person or that person. And these things, we can expect them to be on the rise. We can expect them to crescendo. The time of the end is upon us in this world, and the devil is angry, and he's trying to get as many people as he can to accompany him to a deceiver's demise. Now, the Satan and his angels, their, their future is already spelled out in the Scripture. And Satan is trying to take as many with him as he can possibly take. And this is one way that he does it. More and more things like this are taking place. Someone might see an individual who's already died. They think it's that person. I'm your Aunt Sue, you know. How's it going? I'm your Uncle Bob. Uh, people do see these things, all right? These things actually do take place. And there may be somebody here that's experienced something like this as well, all right? And God has determined that it's best for people to rest or sleep in the grave. To sleep in the grave... Uh, at the moment, the death is going to seem just but a moment to them, though. So there are two sides in this great conflict. You've got God and his angels, and you've got Satan and his angels. And Satan has deployed his wicked angels into the battlefield of this world to go back and to deceive people, and he does it by mimicking the dead back to the living. 
does Satan and his angels really have the ability to do this? They have the ability to work miracles, friends. And you can see this taking place in people's lives in a variety of ways. Well, some people might say, well, that sounds far-fetched. You know, the idea that if, if the devil was out there with his angels, that he'd be out there deceiving them with, you know, images of their dearly departed loved ones. Anyway, I don't see the danger in that. Even if he could do that, what would it matter? Just a little conversation, you know, even if it just looks like my loved one. I mean, if they look the same, sound the same, I mean, I'm fine with that. Is there any problem with that? Do you think there might be a problem conversing with the devil or one of his angels? Do you think you might could lose eternal life by talking to one? I want you to consider the first conversation with the devil by the human family. Eve, in the Garden of Eden, had a conversation with the devil. And look where we are at today. And she, in her perfection, we are marred by 6,000 years of sin and degradation. Are we any match for the enemy? If he can engage us in a conversation, friends, we are on his turf. He has an advantage. Don't let him have that. And you know what? Satan takes advantage of grieving hearts, doesn't he? If you lost a loved one, it would be natural for you to want to see them again. It would be natural for you to want to be near them again. And the devil knows that. And he takes advantage of that with people. Since wizards, witches, and psychics cannot contact the dead, whom are they contacting? Revelation 16 says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. People are not in communication with their dearly departed loved ones, friends. If they're in communication with something, because we know the dead know nothing, and in that very day their thoughts perished, we know that they have to be in communication with sly, deceptive, miracle-working beings. The Bible says they're the spirits of devils working miracles. Many people are following this experience. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 helps us understand where the real danger is once again. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the what times? Latter times. That's us today, isn't it? In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Is it a wise idea to depart from the faith? Yes or no? That would be unwise. The safety is staying with the faith. No, but some are departing from the faith in the latter times. What reason could they give for that foolish course? It says, giving heed to seducing spirits. Seducing spirits. And doctrines of who? Devils. Where are they learning the doctrines of devils from? From the devil. Talking to the devil is one way to learn the doctrine. All right? If we begin to dialogue with Satan in any form, uh, friends, we are in danger. Well, let's look at some more here. <clears throat> I'm going to mention this, and some of you are not experiencing this, and that is fine. But it's worth mentioning that in some homes, people are experiencing some things that are sort of different, odd things taking place in the house. If it's not happened to you, you may have heard of it, though. Uh, people have had experiences with the furniture moving around in the house. Nobody's moving it, but the furniture moves. And the radio, you know, turning on and off by itself. Things going bump in the night, shrieks, unexplainable things like that. And if you have those things going on in the home, it, you, you should do a little inventory. And just ask yourself now, do I have anything in my home that would be a tool of the devil that he could use to try and engage me here in my home to enter into a dialogue with him? Do I have something like a, a Ouija board? Isn't that just an innocent game? No, it's not an innocent game. It has a purpose. And the devil uses that. What about the magic eight ball or dungeons and dragons? What about the amulets, the parrot cards, tea leaves? things like that. Should those be in the home of the Christian? They don't belong in the home of the Christian. Uh, there's other things to ask yourself about too, though, all right? Those aren't, that's not an exhaustive list. But pray about it. And say, Lord, is there anything in my home that is inviting the presence of the enemy here? Uh, they're introductory tools. We want to get them out of the house. You take them out to the burn pile and light them on fire, all right? Have I been to see a psychic lately? Or a, a medium? You know, have I called a psychic hotline? Those kinds of things, we want to leave those out of the, we want to leave those out of our lives completely. And uh, I tell you what, you know, I'm not a big fan of this idea of, of, of having a pastor come to your house and sprinkle some kind of special water on your house and do some kind of exorcism. I think that is, I think that is a, a bad idea. Uh, because somehow it seems to me that man would maybe think that they have the power over the devils. And often it's kind of, oh, you know. But what we really want to do is make the home a very unfriendly place. It's a very unfriendly place for the devil. You know what's unfriendly to the devil? Reading your Bible. You know what's unfriendly to the devil? Singing praises to the king. 
Do you think the an wicked angels and the devil are going to want to stick around hearing those beautiful songs sung to the king? No, they don't want to hear that. Reading scripture, memorizing scripture, you know, having open uh, family worship in the home, Bible study, that space, that place, it becomes very unfriendly to the enemy, friends. You don't need to have an exorcism. We need to have uh, an um, a invitation of God and his presence into our homes through these means, all right? Okay. So if any of you want to talk about those things, if you're experiencing them, that's fine. You can talk with myself or Pastor David. We'll be willing to speak with you about those things. But just get rid of them. Clean them out of the house. No reason to have them any longer. Shifting gears a little bit, 1 Corinthians says this in chapter 15, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Talking about death. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. When is that going to happen? Listen. It says, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. I want to know when they're going to be made alive. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ as soon as they die. You mean to tell me they've got to be, wait to be made alive until Christ comes again? This idea that they're made alive right now as soon as they die is simply not biblical. They're waiting to be made alive when Jesus comes again. Has Jesus come yet? Have they been made alive yet? No. This is the general teaching. Now, again, there's a handful of exceptions, but this generally is true for everybody, uh, most everybody. John chapter 5, 28 and 29 says, All that are in the grave shall hear his voice. So you've got all in the graves hearing his voice and shall come forth. And then you read in John 6, 39, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again. When is he going to raise it up? At the last day, it says. What else does it say? Verse 40 says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him ha may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up. When does it say? Oh, yeah, it says the same thing at the last day. What does verse 44 say in the same chapter? No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up. When does it say? At the last day. But what does verse 54 have to say? Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up. When? At the last day. Is Jesus making it clear when he raises up the dead? At the last day, the last day, the last day, the last day. Not as soon as we die. Can you say amen? All right, now the Bible makes that very clear. Here's another one. Death is a sleep until the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. Paul says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Do you like to be ignorant? Not knowledgeable of the facts. Paul doesn't want it either. In the church, what does he say? Don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant about what? He says, Don't be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Don't be ignorant about what happens when you die. Aren't you glad we study this tonight? So we will no longer be ignorant on this. He says that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Pause right here. Wait a minute. That verse says God is going to bring them with him. Does that mean that when God comes down, he's going to be bringing those that are sleeping with him? Doesn't that mean they're alive in heaven because he's bringing them with him? When Jesus, in John chapter 14, 1 through 3, what did he say? He says, I go that I may prepare a place for you, didn't he? He says, I go and I will come again to receive you, to take you to the places I've prepared for you. So does he make a round trip? He makes a round trip, doesn't he? He comes from there to here, then from here to where? Back to there. All right. When it says God is going to bring them with him, what way do you think it is? From up there down to here or from down here up to there? Down here up to there. It's the way he said it. He says, I will come again and receive you. And this is the return trip, all right? To receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. God is bringing them with him. In fact, if you continue to read the verse, notice what it says. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, that means not precede or go before, them which are asleep. So they're not going to go up with Christ ahead of those that have died in Christ. What happens? It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So get the sequence here. First the dead in Christ rise, then what happens? Then ye which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Who's the them? Those that were dead, that have just been resurrected at the second coming of Christ, collectively with those that are still alive in Christ, 
go up to meet the Lord in the air. It says, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Friends, this is, uh, does this sound like a hopeful passage to you? You know what the Bible says to do with that? It says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Paul says, sorrow not as others that have no hope. He doesn't say, don't sorrow at all, but sorrow knowing that you have this hope. He doesn't say comfort each other with the word that your loved ones are in heaven right now. He says comfort each other with the knowledge that Jesus is coming to raise the dead in Christ to life. That's the hope of the Christian church for those that have died in Jesus Christ. How about it, right? Beautiful. It's the same thing. I already talked to you about John 14. He says, I go to prepare a place. I will come again, and he's going to receive us to himself. You see? Same thing there. Well, that causes perhaps someone to ask now the question. I've heard everything we've studied tonight. The Bible says it, I believe it, but I'm a little confused because you remember that conversation that Jesus had with the thief on the cross? Doesn't that mean that people go straight to heaven as soon as they die? Can we have maybe five or ten more minutes to cover that so that you don't leave here confused on that question? Would that be all right? All right, let's do that right now. What about this thief on the cross exchange? Didn't Jesus tell that thief that he would be in paradise the very day that they were dying there? And doesn't that show that people go straight to heaven when they die? That's a good question. Let's review this together. First, let's find what the thief said. It says, and he said unto Jesus in Luke 23, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's what the thief said. Now, the thief is asking him to remember him when he comes to his kingdom. He doesn't actually ask Jesus to take him to the kingdom that very day. He just asks to remember him when he comes to his kingdom. That's the first thing. What does Jesus reply? And Jesus said unto him, Verily, or truly, I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Oh. Uh-oh. What do we do with that? Is that perplexing? Whose words are these? These are Jesus' own words. You can't escape them, can you? He's telling the thief, why? He says, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But didn't Jesus already tell us repeatedly at the last day, at the last day, at the last day, at the last day? He did. So what do we do? Now here's a principle for you, and it's going to be helpful for you. When you come across a passage that you don't understand, table it, go find out what the other Bible passages have to say on the subject. You're looking for the general teaching. And then let those other verses, the larger body of information, help us explain those that are a little confusing. Don't take that confusing passage and let that be the one that you build your entire theology and doctrine around and then have all the massive scripture contradict you. You see, that wouldn't make any sense, would it? And by the way, should the Christian be satisfied having the Bible contradict itself? Doesn't that just mean that your religious experience has a God that can't get his story to be the same? And what kind of religion is that? Is that something you're going to recommend to others? Come serve my God, but he can't really explain himself in Scripture. He's contradicting himself. Therefore, you can't know the truth. Come and learn the truth from us, but we can't teach the truth. Right? Because we don't know what it is. Because it's confusing. That doesn't sound like a very good position to take, does it? We need to let the general body of Scripture explain the subject of death and then come to these passages that are a little confusing and study them deeper, all right? Now that we know the truth about death, we examine that passage with the proper understanding and say, where is that there? Are you following me now? Where is that there? You know, this whole discussion on this passage could be taken care of if we just understood that the Bible was originally not written with punctuation. That was added later, centuries later, by the medieval church. Does it matter that it was added by the medieval church? It does matter. Why? Because the medieval church was already being affected by some of the false doctrines that had come in from paganism. And when you add punctuation with an incorrect understanding, you can add punctuation in places that it shouldn't go. All right? Now, don't let that shake your faith in the scripture. The text, the words of scripture, they are inspired. The punctuation was added later. The ancient languages, they didn't have the punctuation. That was added later by translators. And there are some places they could have done a better job. This is one of those places. Well, let me show you how this works. It says, and Jesus said unto them, barely, and it goes on. The question that you want to ask yourself is this term today right here. You want to ask, if you were going to be the translator of the Bible now, knowing everything you know, and you were going to add punctuation as you brought it into the English language, I'm going to ask you, where would you put the comma, all right? You're trying to phrase this in a way that makes sense. Now, one other little comment here before we talk more about the comma. 
these two words right here, shalt thou or, these are, these are reversible. You can have thou shalt or shalt thou. Either way, all right, in the translation of this passage, either way those words can be used. It says now, the question we ask is, what part of this verse do we want the word today? What part of the verse does Christ intend this word, this term today to modify? Does he mean it to modify this part that says, shalt thou be with me in paradise, so that it reads, today shalt thou be with me in paradise? Or does he mean this word today to modify the part of the sentence that says, verily I say unto thee, which would then read, verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's the question. Now, if you were translating the Bible and you came to that and there was no punctuation, where would you put the comma? Would you put it before the word today or would you put it after the word today? Knowing everything you've studied from the Bible, where would you put it, translators? You'd put it after the word today, obviously. But they put it before the word today and it's created a lot of confusion, but we needn't be confused on that. The punctuation was added later and this is a place they could have done a better job. Now, here's something for you. That word today is really being used in an, for emphasis, for an, in, in, in an emphatic sense. He's saying, I'm telling you something, thief, and I'm telling it to you today. Or you we might say, I'm telling you right now. You know what I mean? You could, even for emphasis, I'm telling you today. Darren, is there any other place in the Bible that shows us that word today being used in that emphatic sense? There is another place. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12. And this helps because at least it shows you that you can see another place somewhere in the Bible that uses it that way. It says this, turn you to the strongholds, ye prisoners of hope, even today. Do I declare that I will render double unto thee? There it is. It's being used for emphasis. Now, we know this is for emphasis because the thing being talked about here didn't happen on that day. It didn't happen until later. It's being used for emphasis. All right. Punctuation can make a big, big difference. I'm going to show you another place where punctuation can make a big, big difference in the Bible, too. How many here have ever heard of the Bible teaching of sick handkerchiefs? Sick handkerchiefs something you'd have in your pocket or your purse. How many of you have heard of that? Nobody here believes in the Bible doctrine of the sick handkerchief? It's in the Bible. Can I show you? Okay, here we go, Bible students. Acts 19, verse 12. Here's the verse. It says, so that from his body, now you've heard of sick people, sick animals. I'm asking you if you've heard of sick handkerchiefs. It says, so that from his body were brought unto the what? Sick handkerchiefs, I told you, the sick handkerchiefs now, brought unto him, uh, unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. All right, there's the Bible teaching for sick handkerchiefs. I guess we've got to add that one to the list of new teaching, don't we? I learned about, at the seminar, I learned about this, 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 and I learned about their sick handkerchiefs. See? That doesn't read just like it should, does it? If you were a translator of the Bible, what would you have added there? You would have added a comma, wouldn't you? How would that read if you had added it? It would have read, so that from his body were brought unto the sick, comma, handkerchiefs or aprons, comma, and the diseases. Okay, do you see what's happening there? And when you leave punctuation out, things can read a little bit oddly. This is another place where it could have been done better. Punctuation was added later. The text of Scripture comes up inspired, okay? And in most cases, the punctuation is done very good. But there are some places where there is some uh, bit of confusion there. This is another one right there. Well, how do you know where the comma is supposed to go definitely for sure? That's a good question. How do we know? It could go before the word today. could come after the word today. How do we know that it's supposed to come after the word today? Basically, you've got three reasons. One of them we've already touched on. Christ has already shared in Scripture that Scriptures cannot be broken. You're not going to have... Uh, you know, passage, 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 passage. Tell the dead know nothing. The dead praise not the Lord. No thoughts in the grave. Whither you go, you stay there until the last days of the resurrection. You see. You're not going to have all those passages saying all of that, all that, and one verse come over here and topple all of that teaching. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work like that. That's reason number one. You know the comma has to come. Has to come after the word today. Reason number two, we've already talked about as well. The thief didn't even ask to go to paradise that day. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Do we have similar language in the Lord's Prayer? You know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Future recognition of something there with the kingdom, right? The third reason that we know the comma has to come after the word today and not before is probably one of the most potent ones of all. The best argument maybe that you could make about this. How do we know the comma has to come after the word today and not before? He says, and Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee today. Did you want to know something? 
Jesus did not go to paradise that day. What day did Jesus die? Friday. Did you know that Jesus resurrected? What day did he resurrect? Sunday. So the third day now, after his death, can we prove that Jesus didn't go to paradise the day that he died on Calvary's cross beside that thief? He told the thief this. Can we prove, though, that Jesus didn't go to heaven that day? That he didn't go to paradise? Yes, you can. John chapter 20 and verse 17. This is not Friday. This is not the Sabbath. This is Sunday, the resurrection day. Now what do we learn? Jesus is here, uh, and, and uh, Mary Magdalene is there. And notice what Jesus says. Jesus saith unto her, that's to Mary, touch me not. Now, it might be better translated as don't hold on to me. Why is he saying that? Touch me not, for, now, or you could say because, I have not yet ascended to my Father. Here it is Sunday morning, and Jesus says, I have not yet ascended to my Father, he tells Mary. But on Friday, before, when he died, he tells the thief, I tell you, today I'm going to take you to paradise. But here Sunday morning, he says, I'm not yet ascended to my Father. Okay, now I ask you this. Who was Jesus lying to? Was he lying to the thief when he says, you'll be in paradise with me today? Or was he lying to the woman when he said, I haven't been to see my Father, but he really had, back on Friday when he took the thief? Who is he lying to, the woman or the thief? He's not lying to anybody, is he? He's not lying to anybody. We have to have a proper understanding of the passage. The comma, it comes after the word today. Now, there's a little illustration I'll share with you. Helps us understand how important commas can be. Back in the day of the telegraph, there was this uh, couple, and this woman had very fine taste, uh, and her husband knew it, and she wanted to buy a really nice dress that no other lady had. Now, she, had to, she figured she needed to go someplace where she could find that, and uh, so she said, honey, I want to find this beautiful dress, you know, I just something that nobody else has. Can I go and, and look for one and, and purchase one? He says, you know what, you can, but uh, you telegraph me when you find it. Well, she's going to go to France because, I mean, that's where the fashion, you know. And So she goes to France now, and she's over there, and she's walking along and looking in the shops, and she's trying to find this beautiful dress. It's very important for her to find. And so she comes across the shop, she looks in a window there, and she sees a dress in there. It caught her attention. Oh, she's, she's wondering, maybe this is it. Any women here that like to shop? You understand this. She goes into the store now, and she walks over to the body form, and the dress is just exquisite, all right? She just walks around it, and the more she looks, the more impressed she is. Oh, this is it. And she goes around now to the back of the dress, and she has a price tag, it's, and she flips it over in her fingers, and there the price is, $3,000, back in the day of the telegraph. Okay, now she's looking at that, and she's thinking, oh, my, my husband loves me. I don't know if he loves me that much, you know, because she's remembering now. She, she told her husband she would telegraph how much before. And so she went to the telegraph. She wires off a wire. She says, honey, I found the perfect dress. It's only, get that, only, she says, $3,000. All right, she sends it off, and right away the answer from her husband comes back. The telegraph says, no price too high. She says, oh, my husband loves me so much. There's nothing too great for me. She goes right back to that dress store and lays down that large sum of money for that beautiful dress. Anyway, they box it up. She takes it back home. She puts it, she goes into her bedroom now, and she puts on that beautiful dress. And then she comes out into the living area where her husband is seated, and she's just kind of letting it, mm, doo -doo, you know. And her husband looks at her. It's beautiful, all right. Wow. And then it dawns upon him, this must have been the dress his wife had wanted to purchase. And all too late, the importance of a comma comes to his mind because what he meant to say was, no comma, price too high. <laughs> Does a comma make a difference? <laughs> no comma, price too high. Friends, what did Jesus really mean? when he hung on that cross between those two thieves and one of them said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. What did Jesus basically tell him? You might think of it like this. Was Jesus somewhat alone on Calvary's cross? The disciples had fled, hadn't they? And there he is, hanging between heaven and earth, between two thieves. At some point he will utter the wor words, why have you forsaken me? Talking about his father, he feels forsaken not, but he feels that way. It seems like all have deserted him. John is at the foot of the cross, but most everyone is, is just not there for him, is, are they? 
Does he look like a king as he hangs there? Does he look like God, the Son of God? Does he look like he could save anyone into an eternal kingdom? No. He looks his weakest. He looks like he couldn't do anything for anyone. And the thief beside him now starts his sentence to the Lord by saying, Lord. Lord? The one bleeding and dying beside him as a criminal? He calls him Lord? Something's going on in this thief's mind, isn't it? He knows the one beside him now really is truly the sent the Son of God. He really can do something for this poor thief. And in a recognition of that, prompted by God's Holy Spirit, in a recognition of that, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What does Jesus tell the thief? Maybe you could think of it like this. I tell you, I tell you, when it looked like I couldn't do anything for anyone, right now, I'm telling you, when I look my weakest, I tell you today, today when it looks like I could do nothing for you, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And do you know what I think? I think Jesus is still telling people today that they can be with him in paradise. Do you think so too? He's telling us once again. Do you want to be ready for that, friends? Let's pray and tell him so. Let's tell him right now. Father, you've heard it. We want to be ready for you to come. And you remind us again today that we can be with you in paradise. And Father, if there's anything that's standing in the way between us and you, please help us to see that now. This is the time. This is the preparation time. We live right down at the end of time. It's the last day. Lord, if we should die before you come, the passing of time is going to be but a moment. If we would rise, we would pray that we would rise in that resurrection, that resurrection of life. Father, we live so far down here at the end of time, it might just be that we'd be alive when you return. Help us to be doing your work. And when you come found doing that work, put a love in our hearts for you that would cause us, put a desire within us to obey you no matter the cost. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the truth about this subject. We ask that the devil will be able to have his way no longer with us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm glad.